I had the chance to speak with you a little bit earlier today, uh, Rick, off camera, and you mentioned that in your earlier years of the firm, uh, if the firm was making, let's say, for example, a million dollars in uh, one year, 20% of that might be spent on research and dealing with geologists and so forth. Um, uh, could you talk to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, people mistake the nature of almost every business. Um, the junior resource business is an exploration business, which is to say it's not really an asset intensive business. Uh, it's a research and development business. You make money in natural resources in exploration by answering a series of unanswered questions. And so in truth, the human resources of a small company are more important than the physical resources. The value is manifested in the physical resource, but it's done by human processes. So spending a lot of money uh, determining from the management team of the company that you might invest in what is the unanswered question that will add the most value. Did you ask this question because it was convenient or is it actually the best question? Is your thesis supported by the facts on the ground? Is the process by which you propose to answer the thesis valid and efficient? Very importantly, what will constitute failure? In other words, if a company raises $10 million to drill, will they have the good sense after having spent $3 million to understand that their thesis is invalid and save the $7 million for some other useful purpose? Or will they spend the whole $10 million because they raised it? It's absolutely critical. And do you believe that the management team has a plan with regards to a yes or a no answer? Value is added in exploration by a series of unanswered questions. Getting a yes on the first one establishes value, but value is unlocked by answering the question that's proposed by the answer to the first question. The success that I've enjoyed in natural resources has really come from a fairly small number of very, very, very good decisions that yielded quantum returns. And most investors hope for a one-month or a two-month or a three-month answer when in fact getting a yes answer requires 18 months and getting a series of yes answers requires five or six years. So the nature of my disproportionate spending on knowledge had to do with the fact that I understood better than my competitors the process by which money is made. And the process by which money is made is understanding in very rigorous fashion the intellectual capital that's employed in exploration. Spending money to determine what managements actually knew their stuff. Spending money to monitor how well they stuck with their plan, if they had a plan. Spending money to anticipate what the value of a yes answer and what the value of a no answer would be. There are circumstances where a stock doubles and it's still cheap. Where the response you need to make when a stock doubles is to buy more. There are circumstances where if the price of a stock falls in half, the company is precisely twice as valuable. And so despite the fact that it fell in half and hurt your feelings, you need to buy much, much, much more. There are circumstances where the price of a stock doubles for no apparent reason, in which case one needs to sell some stock to lower one's average cost, despite the fact that you feel good because the stock doubled. And the ability to take advantage of the market rather than being taken advantage of by the market involves spending money wisely with very, very, very good people. Ben Graham pointed out that in the short term, the market is a voting machine. It's a source of noise. It represents people's intuition and feelings. And in the long term, it's a weighing machine. It values what things are worth. And money is made in the market by exploiting the arbitrage, the gap between the short term, the way people vote, which is always stupid, and what things are worth. And the way that you understand that is by establishing some basis of valuation so that you can take advantage of the contradictions in the apparent market-related price of an asset relative to its value. And for me, that has involved spending lots of money on geologists and engineers. Rick, I'd like to ask you about the general equities market here, uh, I'm circling back around. Uh, you mentioned quite often that uh, 
bear markets are the authors of bull markets, and bull markets are the authors of bear markets. When we look at the uh, Dow Jones, the S&P 500 today, does it have impending bear market written all over it, and how will that impact a sort of nascent recovery here in natural resources? I'm not a general securities analyst, and so it's difficult for me to talk to valuations in industries that I don't understand well. I'm also not an economist. Uh, I answer questions on economics from the point of view of a cre credit analyst, or in smaller markets, a loan shark, which is what I am. Um, I will tell you that when I, as an amateur, but a hardworking amateur, look at the balance sheets and income statements of the 2,000 largest industrial companies or financial companies in the United States, I am struck by what great companies they are. They responded to the 2008 collapse by strengthening their balance sheets. They're holding excess cash, unlike, as an example, the U.S. federal government. I'm struck by the fact that their operating margins are very strong. I don't know enough about these businesses to know if these margins are sustainable. It concerns me that their margins are at all-time highs. Is this a function of the fact that they re-engineered their businesses to make them permanently better businesses? Or is this a function of the fact that interest rates are artificially low, so demand is encouraged, and their cost of capital are lower? I don't know the answer to those questions. What I do know, Tacoa, that makes me very nervous is that some aspect of the bull market in bonds and some aspect of the bull market in equities is driven by artificially low interest rates. These companies' costs of capital are artificially low, and the capitalized value of the distributions, which is a different way of saying the price of the equities relative to the dividend yield, is artificially low because the yield on competing savings pro uh, products like certificates of deposit or long-term bonds are artificially low. I would suspect that if we have a rise in interest rates, it will have two negative impacts. It will raise the cost of capital for companies that are re relying to some degree on debt on their balance sheet, at the same time that it will lower the capitalized value of their distributions because the yields on competing products will rise. And so my real nervousness about global general debt and equity markets is the impact that a rise in interest rates would have on those markets, and I expect it would be somewhere between negative and catastrophic. Rick, how would you characterize the value of water uh, as a natural resource, as an opportunity? Uh, what might be some of the, uh, the upside as well as some of the, the pitfalls that investors might need to look for in considering that natural resource? Water is a great theme. Uh, you need to know a few things about the water market. It's a local market because water is heavy and water is cheap. So you don't have a water market in place like places like British Columbia where the challenge is to make it go away. Uh, you have a water market in places like the U.S. West and Southwest. Water must be scarce and the society must be rich enough to pay for water. Uh, there's a shortage of water in Djibouti, but it doesn't matter because you can't sell it to anybody. Uh, you want to focus on a place like California or Texas where water is scarce and its utility is the highest. The second thing that you need to know is that water historically has been cheap uh, because there's been more of it than there has been uses. That party is coming to a screeching halt, partly because it's been so cheap. And you also need to know that, market, that water has been mar uh, allocated inefficiently. It's been allocated politically, according to votes, rather than in the market, according to utility. So as an example, here in California, 85% of the water that we've used contributes to 3.5% of GDP. In other words, it's used in agriculture. The other 15% of the water in the state of California generates the other 96.5% of GDP. This has occurred politically. It's pretty easy to understand what happened. Water was allocated politically 80 years ago when the farmers in the state held the balance of the political power. And the political fight necessary to deregulate the price of water hasn't happened in California because the political cost of going against the rural constituencies has been, has been too high while there has been ample water. A young person like you won't remember the past, which is the prologue. The past was 1977, the last time we had a decent drought in California. And it was an enormously disruptive economic event. It was also disruptive for people. They had to do things like literally ration the amount that they used to flush their toilets. Uh, considerable inconvenience, as you can imagine. What's instructive to note about that is that in 1977, there were almost 12 million fewer of us in the, straight, in the state. In other words, there were 12 million fewer straws in the barrel. And in 1977, we were over, able to overdraw our allotment of Colorado River water 
to offset the shortage of water that was produced in state. That was before people lived in places like Las Vegas and Phoenix. Our ability to avail ourselves of the safety valve that existed in 1977 doesn't exist today. What will happen in the United States is that we will ignore the water problem until the water problem is literally on top of us. And when the, lit the water problem is literally on top of us, water will change in price by a quantum. It'll change in price tenfold. People need to anticipate that event, even though the event might not take place for six years or seven years. Because at the point in time when the event takes place, it will be too late to participate. The final thing that you need to understand, or people that need to understand that take advantage of this thesis, is that ultimately the people that take advantage of this thesis will be punished. Water will be regarded as a right. And ultimately the state will steal the arbitrage between what people paid for water and what it was worth. But the state is inefficient. It'll take two or three years. So if you have bought uh, the collection of water stocks, that is an example we recommend here at Global, and you have enjoyed tenfold returns or twelvefold returns, and water is on the cover of Business Week and uh, Slime Magazine and all of these other general, general publications, that's the time to sell. Because ultimately, the state will steal the benefit of your saving and planning. So it's going to be very important when the time comes that you monetize uh, your good fortune before that arbitrage is stolen from you by the voters. Rick, as a final question, you've mentioned on a few occasions that this is going to be your last cycle uh, in natural resources. And as a director of Sprott Inc., uh, how do you hope to shape the organization for the future and how do you view it as it stands today? Well, financial services businesses are just aggregations of people. Uh, when people look at Sprott, they look at our balance sheet, they look at our physical plant, they look at our wonderful art collection. And they don't understand that when the last person goes home, all we have left are desks and phones. So our investment in the future has to do with things like recruiting people like you. Um, we need to, uh, at Sprott, grow our human resources because they're really the only resources we have. I mean, yes, we have a potent balance sheet. Yes, we have important mandates uh, from individual investors, from institutions, and from nations. But what we hope to do within Sprott is nurture the next generation and a subsequent generation of Mark Fobbers and Eric Sprotts and John Embrys and Rick Rule and the outreach programs that we're doing as an example uh, through your video efforts and through Sprott's thoughts does two things. It uh, conveys the paradigm gained by 35 years of investment experience with the first generation of Sprott to investors whom can employ it profitably and enhance the reputation of Sprott at the same time that it prepares the second and third generation of um, Sprott people to hone their skills at investing and also build the reputations that the, the founding generation, my generation, has been able to do. And so the nature of Sprott really will be uh, to continue our focus uh, to uh, continue the critical contrarian thinking uh, that has led to the success of the first generation of Sprott, uh, you know, from one man to a billion dollar organization, to build on the strengths we have and to uh, at once learn from the second and third generation of Sprott personnel because they have a lot to teach us. At the same time that we arm the second and third generation with the knowledge and the attitudes uh, that are inherent in the Sprott franchise. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, one of the huge benefits I've got, gotten from my affiliation with Sprott that was an unintended benefit is the great joy that I personally have received from mentoring. I didn't realize that the um, uh, psychological and uh, intellectual benefit that I've gotten from that is at least equal to the psychological and intellectual benefit that I've gotten from securities analysis. And uh, the benefit that I've gotten from securities analysis has been enormous in the last 35 years. I'm, hell, I'm one of those guys who's never really worked a day in his life. I get up, I'm eager to go to work. 
and the idea that I have the opportunity to imbue uh, other people uh, with that advantage and profit in my declining years uh, monetarily as a large shareholder of Sprott for having done so is almost fictionally good fortune for me. Yeah. All right, well, Rick Rule, Chairman of Sprott U.S. Holdings, uh, thanks for sharing your comments with us. Thank you for the opportunity and welcome aboard.